Hi, this is Zivi Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And speaking of books, I have two of my own books coming out this spring and summer. Princess Charming is a picture book, which debuts on April 19th, and Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature comes out on July 1st, and it is truly a labor of love. I hope you'll pre-order, order, order, and join me on tour as I go across the country. You can find out more at zibbyowens.com or bookendsmemoir.com. And you can follow me on Instagram at zibbyowens because I always post about everything. Enjoy the show. Claire Lynch is the author of Small on Motherhoods. Claire works as a university lecturer and is the author of two academic books and numerous scholarly articles and chapters. Claire's four-thought talk, The Other Mother, was first broadcast on BBC Radio 4 in 2020, and her first piece of narrative nonfiction took second place in the Spread the Word Life Writing Prize in 2017. She was a shortlisted writer for the Penguin Random House Right Now scheme in 2018 and a longlisted writer for the Hinterland Nonfiction Prize in 2019. Small is her first book for a general audience. Welcome, Claire. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss small on motherhoods. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. Claire, this is one of the most beautiful books about motherhood, infertility, miscarriage, having kids, new birth, fear, love, all of it wrapped into one. It's like poetic and beautiful, and I loved it. Thank you so much. That was really kind of you to say. It's um, it's very strange in a way to be talking about it because it was written in lockdown. This kind of idea that it's out in the world still seems a bit strange to me. So it's uh, it's really exciting to kind of realize. Look, real people are holding it in their hands. That's great. I am I am a real person. <laughs> Here it is. It's your whole story. Oh my gosh! I know you said that in the acknowledgments that you had written a lot of it in found time, in the NICU, in little bits and spurts. Tell me a little bit about your writing process of this and also how the form, how you chose this form to tell it, because it is almost like poetry. Yeah, thanks. I mean, I'm really, I thought I was a genius when I came up with the idea of it being called small, because then it let me get away with (laughs) all sorts of kind of tiny fragments. So yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it couldn't be a more appropriate place to talk about it than your podcast, really. This idea that uh, you know, when the babies were in NICU, kind of jotting things down, you know, in those kind of small hours of the night, or I'm sure all kind of all parents know those kinds of sitting on the landing, waiting for people to go to sleep kind of moments when maybe, you know, a good sentence comes into your head and you can't, you know, run off to sit down at the computer, but maybe you can tap out that one sentence on your phone and then come back to it later. So I think some of that stuff is kind of poetry by necessity, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that it comes out in those those, uh, fragments. But also, I guess what I wanted to do with that is, you know, that's kind of my sense of it, that parenthood is, you know, poetry and prose, isn't it? It's kind of these beautiful moments and then a lot of putting chicken nuggets in the oven, you know? So (laughs) that, that kind of getting, trying to capture both of those things through the language, I guess, was what I was trying to get to. You know, sometimes it's these kind of profound moments and, and you know, letting that be on the page as well is what I, what I wanted to try and do. Well, the way you lead us into the childbirth and even the struggle to have children and how the ease at which other couples by being a man and a woman can have a child even, it's something that you know, can't be taken for granted and that you have to sort of work through and you have to defend yourself to random genetics counselors. And it's like very, I mean, humiliating is the wrong word, but you know, I mean, it's like disrespectful that you have to go through all this to have a child or right. It's like, yeah, I mean, I guess the wrong word, wrong word. I don't know. You fill in the word. (laughs) Well, no, I, I think I've probably mellowed in my kind of sense of it over, over the time. And I guess you know, I think there are kind of there are there are different expectations, I suppose, and I guess the medical intervention is necessarily going to be different, but that's different for a lot of couples, mm-hmm. whatever the you know, or people having kids on their own. So I think, yeah, I mean, certainly one of the things that I, I hope that the book does is kind of remind us of, you know, for a lot of people, there's a lot of work to be done before the parenthood even begins, and I think maybe in my case, at least that 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 did affect my kind of perspective on it maybe some of those small moments that are easy to take for granted maybe I do that a little bit less so because of that feeling I don't know I mean it's hard to it's hard to know but I guess all of that is part of it right the kind of before you're not perhaps just a parent from the moment of birth but maybe that kind of from that moment you make the decision 
Mm. that that's what you're going to, you know, what you're trying to be or where you're trying to go, it begins then. And if that's a long journey, then I guess that's a long time where you're sort of thinking about motherhood or parenthood before any of the action starts, I guess. So, you know, I think some of that, the book kind of deals with that, that sort of life on hold uh, experience as well. Maybe we should call them parents in waiting because it's really what yeah. you are. Right. It should have, it should be like a whole category. Like, yeah, like a, like a lady. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the moment when, let me see if I can find it. Cause I don't know if I dog eared it, but the moment where you're sitting in your car and your wife is pregnant and then she calls you and is like, you have to come home right away. And you feel like it's over and you're sitting in your car and screaming at the steering wheel, that raw emotion. And I mean, it was just so like it brought tears to my eyes because like I mean I've been there, other people have been there. Like the you some when you want it so badly and then it's just like taken away and you're so hopeful and then you're not. And oh my gosh. Anyway, that moment, of course I can't find it, but that moment was just so totally beautiful. Anyway, I just wanted to flag that, but I can't find well, it. Well, yeah, I'm sorry about the tears, but yeah, I mean it's uh, <laughs> that's the thing, isn't it? That kind of that kind of proximity between the hope and the Grief, I think, is a really difficult thing to, you know, to deal with, isn't it? That you kind of can move from kind of thinking everything's going perfectly to it not in such a short space of time. And luckily, you know, in that case, it sort of can flip just Mm -hmm. as quickly. Yes. You know. Well, I didn't find that passage, but I did dog ear this passage, which is also beautiful. Um, So I'll just read this. If that's okay, I'll read this paragraph. Um, Whether or not the treatment has worked, it has already changed us. This possible baby already staking its claim on our lives, displacing, at last, the imaginary one who has grown quietly in the shadows over all these years of waiting. I would know him anywhere, the small boy with dark curly hair, a dream child, a work of my imagination, a comfort, and a cancer. The shadow baby has sat behind us on each drive to the clinic. He's waited at the airport every time we've tried to go away to forget about him. He's always at family parties or crawling at the feet of friends when they announce the news of another pregnancy. I know other people have them too. I've seen a shadow baby on a woman's lap when her friends smirk knowingly as she orders an orange juice instead of a glass of wine, when conversations are swiftly changed about spare bedrooms going to waste or biological clocks ticking, you can see them snuggled in the crook of an elbow resting on a hip oh thank you I I mean that's just um I think that was a a part of it that I wrote very early on actually because I think that sort of you know spoiler alert we did end up having children we have three children so you know there's a kind of afterlife uh in the story too but I think that that weight that people experience the weight of waiting I guess to, to sort of use that I think is extremely hard and I think I hope that part of the book is a a call to you know, sensitivity around that or kind of mm-hmm. understanding that, you know, lots of the time, I mean, it seems strange to say, but lots of the things I've written about here are things I would, I didn't say to people at the time. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't have spoken to even very close friends about the things that apparently completely, you know, bizarrely, I'm very happy to write them in a book apparently, but not speak to people in real life. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know what troubling thing that says about my personality, but I, whatever it is, I share that. So, okay. I um, mean, cause it, I that's know. totally fine. Right. That, that's kind of not telling people face to face or whatever. I was, literally, I was standing next to <laughs> the, like the line of moms at pick up the other day for my littlest guy. I have four kids and I was typing like a very heartfelt thing onto Instagram or medium or somewhere. And I was like pouring out my feelings and then posting. And then I looked at the woman next to me. And I'm like, why is it okay that I would like upload this and she could consume it through this intermediary, intermediary like space, but I wouldn't like turn to her and just be like, here's how I'm feeling today. You know, it's like bizarre. Yeah. I mean, you know, if it's in writing somehow, that's okay. I don't know what the thing is, but that, that's a rule, right? That that's fine yeah. to exactly. spill your guts on page or Instagram, but not, you know, So yeah, exactly that. So I mean, I guess, yeah, I think that moment is testament to that, isn't it, really? That all of these people are kind of holding their own stories in because it's such a difficult thing to talk about. So maybe reading about them or kind of then we can talk about the books where those things happen is a little safety valve, maybe. Yeah. I also loved the image of (laughs) you being relegated to the the Lamaze class or whatever it's called with all the dads, right? And your uh, wife is yes. like over there, you know, doing her breathing and all the stuff. And then there you are and you're like, what I, <laughs> what are you doing? Like sitting over there. It's so funny. 
<laughs> oh, the, the poor dads, me and the poor dads. Yeah. I mean, we had a very traditional antenatal class teacher, I guess we would just say here, but I mean, yeah. And it was funny. I mean, it was, it was, it was one of those things. It was, it, it was funny in retrospect, kind of hard at the time, but funny for everyone really, because I mean, you know, nobody really arranges their family life. I don't think, you know, nowadays around those kinds of lines anyhow. So, um, but yeah, she definitely had mums to one end of the room and her dads to another kind of mentality and so um yeah I'm not I was messing with the system <laughs> let's put it that way <laughs> and then of course you write about having the girls and then the NICU and you know post NICU and just having to deal with twins and how that I mean I have twins it is like a quite a club to be a part of you know it's <laughs> it's a lot and the way you even wrote about that so tell me tell me more about getting through the challenging time and then how you felt arriving home and all of that. Yeah, well, I guess I guess you know all of this. I mean, I don't know when, did you have your twins first or twins? Yeah. yeah. So I feel like we're the lucky ones in a sense, because yes. if you don't know any better, yep. then it's kind of in at the deep end and that's fine. I mean, you know, I I, I think one of the major, major things we did there is make friends with people who have triplets, because then you feel like your life is easy. <laughs> so, you know, that's top tip for anyone expecting twins. Yeah, I mean, I think it was, it's what the... I guess the book captures that kind of long process of getting there. And then when you're there, suddenly it's kind of all action, isn't it? So, yeah, I mean, I think mostly that sort of sense of suddenly being this kind of foursome, kind of getting through the world together and, you know, watching watching them grow and discover language together and discover each other. And, you know, being that sort of unit, forcing you to kind of see the world differently. I think that's just you know, I don't think anything prepares you really quite for what that's like, that kind of shift in perspective that comes from, you know, small people navigating the world and you therefore having to navigate the world through them. And I think we could talk about it more, really. I think, you know, those kind of ways of being forced to look at yourself differently because of constantly having to explain everything, you know, that's a great... (laughs) A great test of how little you know, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> to be constantly asked. Totally. You know, <laughs> constantly asked questions that you can never answer. So I think it's, you know, it's all of that from the, you know, from the very beginning up until kind of now, all of that is, you know, great food for thought, I think. Last night we were watching TV and somebody on TV said something about like eliminating single use plastic. And my daughter's like, well, what do they mean? I'm like, well, they they don't want you to just use plastic one time. And and my daughter's like, well, what should we do? And I was like, use it twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that solves all the problems. I'm like, I don't know. Just, I don't want to go back to TV now. <laughs> I mean, I feel like you've got off quite easy with that. I had on the way to school this morning, how many bike rides have you been on in your entire life? Mm, mm-hmm. I'm like, I don't, I don't have a number for that. And they're just outraged by my ignorance, to be honest. They're like, how have you not been keeping... Yeah, counts. You know, I'm, like, I just, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. I just haven't got the data to to back up any of my opinions. So yeah, single use plastics, failure to account for everything you've ever done in your life. Yes. You know, it's just a constant failure, really. I feel like I'm very grateful to Siri because every time oh, the yeah. kids ask me, I'm just like, uh, Siri. Yeah, thank God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Mommy's just stepping outside yeah. the room for a second to <laughs> consult with the Oracle. Exactly. So how old are your kids now? Uh, the twins are six and the little one's three. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, I get pitched a lot of books about motherhood and I read a lot of books about motherhood because obviously I'm in it and I'm interested and I love it and, you know, all of that. But I feel like this book really stood out in the way it was written and sort of the beauty of the prose and the introspection mixed with, you know, just beautiful language. So tell me a little about your approach to language, your training, your writing, like all of that side of you. Oh, okay. So thank you. That's really kind to say. So my day job is I'm an academic. I'm a professor of literature. And uh, really, I think I because of that, I, I was only used to writing in a very rigid, very, I'm doing a very frowny face into the camera now, like a sensible, <laughs> serious academic style of writing. And so in a sense, a good thing about that is I probably felt that the only way I could write differently was to write completely differently. And to kind of, you know, try and forget all of the rules that I <laughs> am normally kind of supposed to adhere to and write something, you know, that that was was free from that a bit. And I do think that the the kind of constrained time 
in which I was able to write also kind of helped that sort of stylistically that, you know, I had to use the time I had, which meant that, you know, I had to make every word count. And I think, you know, the other thing about the kind of process is that I had no idea until I wrote this, that the editorial process is such an incredible thing. (laughs) <laughs> you know, another person is going to really help you and work and, uh, you know, ask you those questions that you didn't know you need asking. And I think that really, so the, this book is part of a new imprint called Brazen and Romley Morgan is my publisher there. And she just kind of let me do, you know, what I felt was right, but also kind of just made me raise my game. And I think, you know, that is just such a gift, really, you know, to be able to have someone just give you that little nudge of confidence, you know that you can do something with writing that you haven't done before. So, you know, I hope everyone gets that from somewhere, you know, that kind of person who will just say to you, you know, why not give it a little Mm. bit of a go? What books do you like to read? Oh, I was hoping you weren't going to ask me that question. Or just genre. Only because, you know, as I said, I'm about to now launch into a long lecture of all the books that I like to read. No, I won't do that. I mean, I obviously I do like reading memoir and nonfiction. I'm trying to train myself out of, doing that for a little while at the moment and just enjoy some novels but non-fiction wise I love Sinead Gleason's Constellations I don't know if you've come across that and yeah. um, it's a brilliant brilliant kind of I love collections of kind of connected essays where mm-hmm. you know you don't quite notice you know where you're going and Mar- Maggie O'Farrell's essays in that respect mm-hmm. too just those ones that you just kind of think that kind of sense of it's unbelievable that something is kind of pulled together so well and it feels kind of effortless and and yet you know right that real effort has gone into that all the same that's something so amazing to me that you know that kind of just not not let the not let the pencil marks show somehow I just love that kind of writing beautiful yeah I haven't heard of constellations but now I'm gonna go look Um, well let me let let me add that to your I'm sure you've got such a small list of books that you need to read I don't even today discuss I'm like like, I can't even look over there like I'm assuming that whole shelf behind you is just this week's (laughs) That I haven't touched since a year ago. I made that shelf and... Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it looks beautiful. This one yeah, I keep... Yeah. This one's almost untouchable. And then I have the ones ahead of me that, yeah, that I are like my working shelves. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming there's one of those like balloon nets in the ceiling above you and you just release them <laughs> when it's time to read something else. That would be really cool. I would love to have balloons in here, like all the same colors of the books that yeah. I read and I'll drop. That would be so fun. Maybe Friday I'll... night release. yeah. Or maybe I could do some sort of filter where I see what that looks like without having to actually do it. That would be fun. Thanks. All right. Fun times. I'm sure the kids could help me with that. Anyway. Okay. So what are you working on now? Are you going to do, are you going to write another memoir? Are you, what are you working on? I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, I say this with real hesitation. I'm going to try and write some fiction. I think I'm going to see, you know, I feel like it's kind of the, what's the, what is there to lose to try and see what, see how it turns out. So I've got a little idea for a novel. I'm going to give that a go. I really enjoyed the kind of the, the sort of process of this book, you know, kind of going back into the not too distant past, but having enough time away to, to you know, see it differently. So maybe, you know, maybe I'm hoping that there might be another something like that in the future. Um, but I haven't really lived any other life yet. So I need a little bit of time to pass because this one goes <laughs> up to pretty much, you know, yeah, pretty I mean, much now. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'd need a little bit. It would of, have to um, go f- even further back. You'd exactly. Have to, yeah. You know, my memoirs from, you know, 18 yeah. months old onwards or something right. like that. I don't really yes, yes. think that's <laughs> of interest. But yeah. And, and, you know, I have a kind of uh, sort of in the back of my mind one day, there could be a version where the girls are kind of writing it with me. You know, that yeah. would be a great yeah. book, you know, that if you could collaborate and uh, you know, for chapter two, that would be brilliant. I wonder if you could do like a if you could do a memoir from the point of view of a baby, you know, like that. That would be, be a good challenge. That's, that right? sounds like a yeah, creative writing workshop. Yeah, you know, beginning. Yeah, well, you, you go time. ahead and try that. I mean, right, I'll let you know how it goes. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to read. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What advice would you have for aspiring authors? I think don't be afraid of those little snippets of time, really, because I think it's very easy to you know, God, sorry to be so on brand for your podcast, but, you know, I think that idea that you have to kind of have the the sort of writer's retreat or the kind of long stretches of time and the exact right headspace, maybe that happens for some people, but I think for the most part, everyone's just squeezing it in here and there. And I don't think you have to 
assume that means poor quality. You know, I think you can get those kind of tiny gems that then expand into the good stuff when you have got a bit more time. So I'd say just, you know, the notes app on your phone is your friend. I remember taking my laptop to like different doctor's appointments and waiting rooms and like there'd be like screaming kids and there I'd be yeah. like trying to be like, <laughs> let me just try exactly. to And you know, you, you never know what's going to come out, right? That's, never know. Yeah. There's no yeah. harm. Yeah. But imagine maybe it would be a billion times better if you could actually sit down at a desk. Yeah, I mean, you know, let's not pretend not. that would be, that maybe would not. be lovely. I'm not against yeah. that. If anyone is here offering me a cabin in the woods with, you know, <laughs> a butler, I'm I'm fine with it. But, you know, if you haven't got that available, yeah, make the I'll most tell, of the app. Uh, Yado to come knocking on your door. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> I won't say, oh, no, sorry. I'd rather actually be, you know, in a supermarket car park with the... <laughs> Frantically jotting down something on my phone. Yeah. <laughs> oh, anyway. Okay. Well, Claire, thank you so much. Again, this book is beautiful. And yeah, I'm just really glad I read it and glad to have met you. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. I just want to quickly say, I just love the beginning part of your podcast. Every time I listen to it and you say, it's like, hello from some of my kids. I like to think that there's kind of 25 of them and you have like a rotor, like I'm just letting one or two of them say hello today. And then next time it's <laughs> numbers three to 13. I just, you know, I have this kind of vision. I know, I think some of my kids is misleading. I should have said most of my kids. I don't no, know. No, no, don't, don't take that image away from me. I really enjoy kind of thinking, oh, I wonder who's saying hello today. <laughs> <laughs> it's really that my older son refuses to participate, but that's okay. He's like, uh, no, thanks. <laughs> Oh, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Teenage, teenager is like, no, I'm done. But yeah. Anyway. All fair right. Thanks really so much. To talk to you. Have a great Bye, day. Zibby. Take care. Bye. Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. If you like this podcast, you will love my new anthology called Moms Don't Have Time to Have Kids. Check it out, and you'll hear from 49 authors about all sorts of things moms don't have time to do. All the authors have been on this podcast. Also, check out my TikTok, at with Zibby and Tracy, my other podcast, Sex Talk with Zibby and Tracy. Check out Moms Don't Have Time to Write on Medium. And of course, my new publishing company called Zibby Books. And now back to our daily author interview site and a quick hello from some of my kids. Hi. Hi. Hello. Enjoy the show. 